Good morning, Southside. It is always, always a joy to be back here. Um, it's an excitement. This is where my uh, wife and kids and I spiritually grew up, and so it's always a homecoming coming here. Uh, being able to baptize Jarrett this morning, uh, to see him grow in the Lord, uh, to see him not only grow in the Lord, but honor the Lord to a degree uh, where he is now pouring into others always excites me. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples. And we often stop short of baptism. But one thing that I emphasized with Jarrett was that we're to teach all that Jesus commanded. And uh, I praise the Lord that he is a living example of that. Southside, it's always a joy to get to see you all because you have been our sending church. For the last two and a half years, we have been down in the Liberty Hill area. Uh, we are a church um, down there that is a, has merged with another church, First Baptist Georgetown, and we are the Liberty Hill campus out there. And I want to share very briefly, just to update you as your local missionary, what that has been like. My wife and children and I moved down two and a half years ago and uh, took on a small church there. Uh, that was full of love and compassion and had a desire to make disciples. And in the midst of that, uh, God began to have us pray for a dear friend, uh, Kevin. And we, through that process, uh, merged our church with them. We thought, how can we do this better together? And so I want to share very quickly locally what God is doing in Liberty Hill. We launched out our church a year and a half ago. And through launching this church, we really didn't know what to expect in a community that is so spiritually oppressed. You drive into Liberty Hill and you think, what is going on here? Um, but what has been so neat to see is God uh, had two sets of people who were ready to go minister. And as they went to go minister together as two separate churches becoming one, the neat thing was is you began to see people coming from the community. You begin to see people who had the same vision, the same like-mindedness, and we are seeing God move in some amazing ways there. Um, we've launched out life groups. We've launched out home groups. We have launched out many, many efforts in partnering with our community. And it brings me such joy to share that with you today because you guys have been our local body. You have been the, the, the church that sent us out and so you guys have played a part in that. And I want to thank you all for discipling me, for discipling my family, for helping us grow. There are many men in this body today that I'm out looking at. And, and I see how each and every one of you were used in my life in some way. Um, whether it be to become a better husband, uh, a better father, um, most of all, a better follower of Christ. And so I want you to know that the work that you have poured in to our family has not gone void, but it's very fruitful. And so thank you all for inviting me back here today. It's exciting. If you have your Bibles, please go ahead and turn to Luke 14. One thing that, that I like to share about is we are, many people think that in, in Liberty Hill, we are the, the hill country. You actually have to go about uh, a good 30 miles to actually find hills uh, where we're at. But if you go about 75 miles from where we're at, you will hear a famous landmark, uh, Enchanted Rock. What that is is a pink granite rock um, that, that people come from all over to look at. Now, to share with you about Enchanted Rock, uh, it's about 640 acres. It spreads over 640 acres. It's only about 425, 450 feet tall. And so you think, well, that's not very big. But you have to remind yourself, this is a rock. And so when you're driving to Enchanted Rock... Uh, you begin to see this little hill, and as you see this hill, you're thinking, okay, this is just another one of the rolling hills, and it's really not. You have to remind yourself, hey, I'm looking at a rock. As you get closer, obviously, it becomes bigger and bigger, and by the time you're standing at the base of Enchanted Rock, you're looking up, and you're convincing yourself that you're not looking at a mountain. And so this particular rock can be very deceiving. Uh, it can be considered a hill. It can be considered a, a, a mountain for someone looking up. Um, but most of all, we have to remind ourselves it's a rock. Um, it is a pink granite stone rock. And, and, and I share that today because at times we can look very far off at things and believe it's one thing. Yet when we get up close and personal with it, um, we become convinced of something else. And so this morning we're going to get a glimpse of Jesus in a, 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 t a story in which he communicates uh, with a crowd of people 
And uh, they step back asking themselves, what are we w really willing to do? And so uh, just to share a little bit about the, about the background in Luke 14, you've got some parables that are being told. You're told of a story of, of a, a, a great ruler who wants to have uh, a banquet. And so he goes and he invites all the people he thinks he would come, and every one of them has an excuse as to why they are not going to come to this banquet. Come up with all kinds, and it makes this ruler very angry. As he gets angry, he tells his servants to go invite anyone who will come. And what you end up with is the poor and the peasants who come to this banquet. And so we're left seeing that the people we think are the people who would come to this banquet are actually making excuses. Yet the ones who you would not expect to step into a banquet are the ones who come running. And so this morning, we pick up there in Luke 15, uh, 14, starting in verse 25. If you'll just read the, the word with me, Scripture says, Now the great crowds accompanied him, talking about Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now I want to stop right there for just a moment. When we look at the scripture, we see that there, are, there is a great crowd that's coming. Anytime Jesus was out and he was sharing the word, it drew crowds. And you typically had two people within a crowd. You had the first crowd, which was very mesmerized at what Jesus said. They were intrigued at what he was saying. Their lives were probably changed uh, at some point, and they wanted to follow Jesus. They saw the great miracles that he did the great works he was doing, and they saw lives being changed. And so you had this crowd that wanted to see more, more of what Jesus was doing. And then you had crowd number two. A crowd number two was a little bit different. They were uh, a group of people who were interested in seeing what Jesus was doing. They were a group of people who were, ex were, were uh, constantly following him to see what was taking place, but they weren't doing it for the right reasons. This crowd was very skeptical. Uh, this crowd was often left angry, uh, bitter, um, because Jesus would say and do things that were not uh, what they would consider uh, the law. And so as we see uh, this crowd continuing to get big, we have this, this group of people here in which Jesus is going to question. Now, when you think about crowd number two, I want you to think about words or, or scripture like this. In Mark 2, verses 16 and 17, the scripture saying, the scribe said to the Pharisees, when they saw he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, I came, to call the right, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Another example is in Matthew 23, 12 through 13, when it says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. What a great homecoming sermon, right? I'm not here to share uh, a downer sermon. What I'm here to, to do is to get us to take a look at how are we following Jesus? What are we doing when we communicate that we are Christians? It's a label that's out today that's very common. You can go on social media and you can see anyone identifies with being a Christian if they don't identify with another religion. But when we're looking at that from a, a far off distance, it works. As you get closer and closer and closer, you begin to see that it doesn't, it doesn't go over so well. And so Jesus, in the midst of drawing these crowds in, begins to say some things that, that actually would thin the herd. As I mentioned a while ago, we're in a day and age where technology is blowing up, where Twitter is, is, a great, is great. The more followers you get, the more people uh, perceive that you have power. The more friends that you get on Facebook, the more power you supposedly have, or the more influence you supposedly have. But yet when we base what we're looking at off of Jesus, he had no problem saying the right things to kind of thin the herd. And so that's what's taking place here. Jesus begins to thin the herd. He begins to say something that does not sound uh, as, as appealing as one might think. Now look at this for just a moment. He says in verse 25, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, if you'll notice in this, we're going to see three moments where Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple. And Jesus says, 
In this one, you cannot be my disciple if you are unwilling to, and he goes down the list here. I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, why would Jesus tell me to hate these particular people? Why would Jesus call me to have hatred towards the one who gave birth to me? Why would he have me have, uh, give me hatred towards someone who married me or my children? Why would Jesus command something of like this? Well, I'm a very visual person and I think of the family structure. When I see the, the relationships that are in my life, I am considerably blessed I have a great relationship with my parents. I, I love my parents dearly. I know that I'm loved by them. When I look at my wife, I, I know that this is someone who did not have to marry me, who did not have to love me, but Melissa chose to love me. And that's exciting to know because that's a great picture of what Jesus and our relationship with him looks like. He never had to love, yet he chose to extend that love. And so marriage, we see, is a consistent picture of the relationship between us and Christ. And in the parental relationship, I see so many kids here today. Can you think for just a moment, would Jesus be telling us to actually hate those children? Now, what we don't want to do is we don't want to soften the word, up, the word of God up. We don't want to water it down by no means. But what we want to communicate is this. When it comes to discipleship, when it comes to being a disciple of Christ, what Christ is communicating here is that we have to, be, we have to surrender absolute totality of our life. We must be willing to give up every part of our life. The one who formed the oceans, the one who formed the earth, the night, the day, the one who gave us the, the vegetation and the animals, the one who gave us our spouses, he created all things. And because of that, he has sovereignly placed himself in a position where he deserves all glory. He wasn't finished when he began to put together this model. He knew that sin was going to creep into the garden, that at some point Adam and Eve was going to fail and so he had a provision over even that. That provision, his name was Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ. He sends his son to lay his life down so that you and I are no, no more marred by, skin, by sin. He lays his life down for the wretched. He lays his life down for those who need to be redeemed. Jesus himself laid himself, himself gladly down. Why? Because of his love for the Father. You see, Jesus loved the Father more than he loved anything. And Jesus is the prime example of who we should be, right? And so as we imitate Jesus, we should understand that what Jesus is communicating here is the cost of following him is so big that we must be willing to lay down any relationship. Now, this is not saying, hey, you're, you're to go out and you're to get rid of those relationships. You should love Jesus more than any relationship that you could ever think of. When I think of the three structures there, the spouse, the, the parents, the, the children, when I think of those, those situations there, I think God has blessed me with them. He has given them to me so that I may relish in them, so that I may give thanks to him for them. But I must always remember, first and foremost, that I must love him more. And so Jesus is saying, listen, if you're not willing to love me more, you have unwor you're unworthy to be my disciple. If you're gonna cling to what I've given you, you're not worthy to be my disciple. So we see a great cost there. So we see how he's thinning the crowd there. You think about fads that have come and gone. I, I was reading the other day, in the 70s, it was the pet rock, right? In the 90s, uh, we, we had uh, uh, beanie babies. Remember those? Like everybody was going to just retire off of beanie babies. McDonald's was so excited about it, they got on board. And so you had the beanie babies thing. Early, late 90s, early 2000s, we had the, the WWJD bracelets, right? What would Jesus do? I wore one. I wasn't even a believer, right? They're great fads. They're things that, that look very cool at the time. They're appealing at the time. And what Jesus is saying here is I'm not a fad. What I am is one who gave my life so that you may give your life. And we must understand that Jesus has enforced here a command of you must love me more than anyone else. You know, when I share with people that I'm number two in my wife's life, I've gotten some funny looks over the years. But as her husband, I want Melissa to love Jesus Christ more than she loves me. 
I want her to saturate her life with Jesus Christ before me. I come number two when it comes to Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, I want us to understand that we, in order to follow Christ, must come into understanding that Jesus demands every bit of these relationships to be second to him. Now listen to this, second one we see, verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross cannot come after me, he cannot, or cannot be my disciple. So we're beginning to see here that there's another element to this. You cannot be my disciple if you're not willing to bear your cross. You and I have a hard time struggling or dealing with that today because everybody wears crosses around their necks. They put them up on their walls. They do things like that. And those are not bad. Those are reminders. Reminders, right? You look back at that and you go, this is what Christ did for me. Okay, but in first century Christianity, what we're looking at, what we're dealing with, is we're dealing with a people who truly knew what the cross meant. It was the sign of the crucifix, right? It was a sign of if you rebel against the Roman government, here's what will happen to you. It was, it was a communication tool for the Roman government that if you in any way, shape, or form rebelled against us, we're going to take care of the matter. You see, the Roman government would often crucify people who, who went against them and put them up on a cross or put them on this cross right outside of town so that when people were walking in, when visitors were walking in, they would be reminded, hey, do not mess with the Roman government. So Jesus is telling them, hey, listen, if you're not willing to take up this cross, if you're not willing to bear this cross on my behalf, then you can't be my disciple. In the Western world, we struggle because we don't face enough uh, persecution today. We face persecution in our own ways, like, hey, Starbucks made my coffee wrong today. Or, hey, Chick-fil-A didn't get my order right. Or somebody did something wrong, and that was my persecution for the day. Somebody said something wrong about me. The persecution that Jesus is talking about here is death. If you're not willing, if you're unwilling to follow me to your death, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And this is kind of difficult because we could all sit here this morning and say, we're willing to follow Jesus. We're willing to go the distance for him. But as he's pointing out these, you cannot be my disciples if, we have to ask ourselves, do we love Jesus more than this? Do we love him more than that? Why? Because God is supreme. God is the one who has made all things possible through him. He's the one who has created life. He's the one who's given life. He's the one who defines life. Our, uh, our proclamation as Christians this morning, as we baptized Jared, was, hey, listen, we recognize that Jared has submitted his life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We often look at, at, at a, uh, salvation from a salvation standpoint, but when we are submitting and, and receiving the salvation from the Lord, we are also committing to living under his lordship. Jesus has now become our Lord. And so under that lordship, we must be willing to accept that what he deems as being a disciple is what we must follow for his glory and his glory alone. I love this in verse, uh, in Isaiah 48, 9 through 10, the scriptures say, for my namesake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will give to no other. God is a jealous God, and because of that, he requires that we be willing to lay every bit of ourselves down in order to sustain his glory, even to the point of death. When I was thinking about this text, I, I, I saw the first two. I saw that we are to be willing to lay all things aside, and I saw that we're willing to be able to go to our deaths and two and a half years ago, I shared with you guys, God was calling us to Liberty Hill. And that was a struggle for, my, for, for my, my wife and I in the beginning because this is where all of our family is from. All of, our, all, all of our biological family is here outside of one brother. We have uh, all of our church family is here. All of our friends are here. And so God was calling us to this little town. We had no clue what a Liberty Hill was for nothing. When we pulled into Liberty Hill, my son looked at me. My son looked at me because we saw a population 962. Now, if you pull into Liberty Hill, you know that that is lying, right? There are 
buildings going up all around. There's houses going up all around. My sons were convinced that God was taking us to an unknown land, and we knew that we were headed that way. But one thing that we kept telling ourselves as a family was God's supreme. God's in control, and God has called us. In the midst of the trials of adjusting to life, we'd been raised in and around Abilene, adjusting to those trials of being down there alone in the beginning, not really understanding uh, how, the, how the church family was going to work. We had saw early on how they were towards us, right? But there's a honeymoon that at some point will wear off. Not really knowing how that was going to take place, we knew we were taking a big step. But God has been so faithful. And it took that response of obedience to, to, to following him, even to the point of the unknown. And this is what Jesus declares. He gives two examples. He says, uh, th- as, he's, as he's given the example, he says, verse 28, for which of you desiring a, a, to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid the foundation, he's unable to finish all will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was unable to finish. As he's talking to the crowd, as he's communicating to them, he wants them to understand there is a cost that's required of them, and because of that, they must follow through. They must understand that they, they need to look before they follow him and go, am I willing to give up everything? Coming home and seeing my, my, my father-in-law from time to time, uh, I get excited uh, to go and visit with him and hear all that he's doing. God used him uh, years ago uh, to lead his family out, outside of town here, and, and he built a uh, shop, and after he built a shop, he built his house, and after he built his house, he built the swimming pool and everything else that, that goes around it. And I love hearing the stories about it, but if you go about a mile, uh, about a half a mile from his house, you see what would have been one of the most beautiful houses that someone could lay their, their eyes on in that area. You see that there was a swimming pool. It was a two-story house. Um, there, there was a, a little drive-through uh, for, for people to park. But one thing you also see is right in the midst of that, something happened. The story goes that, that it was not up to code, and so they had to shut down everything. And so you see a house that's halfway built. That beautiful pool, it's filled with some sort of black, murky stuff. The grounds, the the landscaping, it's terrible. The house just sits in ruins. And when I look at scripture and I see what Jesus is saying about counting the cost of following him, it makes me think about that. How often are we so excited about jumping into a relationship that when we get into the tough times, we step back and we want to abandon it. As we're driving up and we're getting closer and closer and closer, we begin to question ourselves. How close are we willing to go? How far are we willing to go for Jesus? And so he's saying, you must count the cost. You must think of these costs that's taking place here. You must be willing to go the distance for me. Because what's going to happen if you don't count that cost is you're going to find yourself in a state where it's unfinished. He continues on. He says, or what king going out to another king in war will not sit Sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who is against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for the terms of peace. As he's communicating to them, he says, here's another way of thinking about this. The costs are going to be great. You're going to look outnumbered at times. You're going to feel weak at times. You're going to be burdened at times. But here's the thing. Are you not going to think about this as you're following me? Are you not going to think about who's supreme, who to look back to, who to put your eyes on in the midst of this? Who are you going to praise in the midst of it? What does it look like when we're walking through our storms of life? Who are we, requ- are, are, who are we throwing our focus onto? Who are we willing to lay our lives down? This king, he's counting the cost. He's thinking about it before they're coming up because he knows he's going to lose lives. He knows that he has to have a strategy. And he knows deep down that if he can't somehow win, there's got to be a treaty. And if you look at a treaty, you understand it's a compromise that takes place. 
It entails two people, two sides giving in to reach an agreement. What's, what we must understand is there is, no, there is no two sides when it comes to Jesus. It's Jesus himself. He has declared what is worthy. He's declared what is right. He's declared what it means to be his disciple. So he finishes up. So therefore, if any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple, we see the third one there. The third, you cannot be my disciple. If you're not willing to lay everything down to be my disciple, then you cannot be it. If you can't lay down every single bit of your life in order to be my disciple, then you're not worthy of it. Jesus, those are harsh words. How do I take that in? How do I, how do I accept that? Well, the application is easy. By submitting to it. By submitting to him. You see, Jesus will cost us everything. There was a great uh, book that came out a few years ago that talks about that. Great da- uh, the, the, the gain or the cost of, of following Jesus is everything, but the gain is absolutely everything. We also can be reminded that every time that Jesus mentions something of the sort that sounds so humanistically un, un, impossible, that Jesus provides himself. When we step back and, and look and go, Jesus, I can't, I'm struggling loving you more than this relationship. Well, if you rely more on Jesus, he will provide. Jesus, will I truly follow you to my death? Well, if you focus more on him, he will provide. Jesus, I'm counting the cost, but I need you. He will provide. How can we do that today? This is very practical. How can we do that today? We can understand that every time Jesus issues a great warning, such as this, that he also issues a great invitation. Right? We cannot possibly do these things from human regards, but we can rely on Jesus. Every time that we look throughout Scripture and Jesus issues something like this, we are encouraged because Jesus is reminding us that he is still supreme. Second thing is this, that we remain focused. When you became a believer in Jesus Christ, you aligned yourself with him. You're no longer yourself. You have become Jesus You have become like Jesus, imitators of Jesus. His spirit has now come to dwell inside you. And so we're given opportunities like prayer, the open line of communication. We're given his word, the most direct and the most valuable piece of of exciting messages, message of hope for us. We're given his word. And then we should be encouraged that it should flow. His word must flow. When we rely on these three things, we can be encouraged. We can be encouraged that Jesus provides the joy in fulfillment. As I see that him thinning a crowd, I see the other side. I put my kingdom lenses on and I think about the men and the women and the children who are willing to step up and say, I'll follow you, Jesus. I'll count the cost and I'll follow you. I'll set it aside and I'll follow you. My question is today, as we've driven up, as we look at the mountain, are we willing to go up it for the sake of the glory of God and his kingdom? Are we willing to learn ourselves? Are we willing to grow ourselves? And are we willing to pour into others for the sake of the kingdom? I love Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, only Jesus who bids us follow him knows where the path will lead. It's only Jesus who knows. We know that it will be a path of mercy beyond measure. Discipleship is joy. You see, when Jesus was declaring, you cannot be my disciple if, he was also declaring, if you're willing to do this, you can be my disciple. And so I ask us here today, what does this look like in your life? As we step back, as we examine the scriptures, as we listen to the spirit of God, where are you in your walk today? Are you one who's been looking off afar and thinking that you're fine? Or when you look at the word of God, are you willing to count all costs to follow him? Are you willing to submit your life in a life of obedience to see the glory of the kingdom proclaimed to others? You see, I shared this morning that it was a special moment for me because Jarrett was one of my first guys that God called me to go and duplicate what many men had done for me. And I seen what God had done in my life through the lives of these men who were willing to just take some time and pour into me. 
and to be able to see how God has moved in the lives of other men and how they're doing the same, I encourage us as a church, as a body, as a family who has sent out so many disciples to continue doing so, not for the sake of saying, hey, we've sent out a lot of people, but for the sake of saying we have participated in seeing the kingdom of God expand for the glory of God.